Welcome, everybody, to our uh, Friday Tech Talk. Appreciate your being here and listening in. You can see my title slide there and some tantalizing images that I'll talk about shortly. I actually welcome um, questions during the during the conversation. I'm not sure if the streaming forum lets you ask questions, but if you can find a way to get my attention, please do so. I, I welcome that. And with that, I'll move into the to the talk. Here's a little bit of an outline. Um, I'm heavily involved in the IEEE and some of its society programs. I'm going to advertise a few things there. This may, may or may not be relevant to you, but if it is, I hope it's interesting. If not, bear with me. Then I'll get to my uh, motivation for the talk. Um, you'll, you'll see that in just a minute. And then the core is uh, phased array modeling. And then I'll show some um, fun pictures at the end. A little bit about IEEE and some of the activities. This is just one of uh, one of the societies that are active in Utah, the um, uh, Intense Propagation uh, Society, the IEEE. We offer research grants, travel grants, design competitions. Um, we do events focused for students, um, so on and so forth. Uh, this slide shows a little bit about our research grants available to um, undergraduates and graduate students. You're welcome to contact me if you'd like more information there. We do an annual design competition, which is really fun. Uh, finalist teams get money to travel to our international annual symposium on intensive propagation to show off their designs. And there's prizes and, and winners every year. We have a resource center where we've collected talks and videos and learning modules and so forth in our field. That's available at the IEEE website. You can see some links there. Uh, one last slide before I leave my introductory material. If you're a student and interested in graduate studies, or if you're not a student and want to come back, we have some wonderful opportunities for furthering your education here at BYU in electrical and computer engineering. And this slide shows some ways you can get more information about that. So that's my preface. Um, IEEE activities, um, ways to connect with the department if you're interested in further graduate school. And now I'll jump into the core of my talk. I'm going to motivate this with some scientific mysteries connected with the universe that we live in. It was uh, realized in maybe the 1970s and 80s that if you look at the stars in a galaxy, calculate the gravitational forces, and use uh, the laws of motion, galaxies should look very different from what they do. They should have a rapidly, randomly spinning inner core and then diffuse stars on the outside. Very different than the beautiful spiral arm galaxies and elliptical galaxies we actually see uh, with telescopes. Uh, for, you know, nobody knows why that is really, uh, but we have a hypothesis. Apparently, there's something around the clusters around each galaxy called dark matter that nobody knows what it is, but it has to be there. In fact, there's maybe 20 times more dark matter in every galaxy. That's gone from just a hypothesis to something with more and more evidence. We can now map dark matter by looking at the way gas clouds accrete to the dark matter based on gravitational attraction. It becomes news in astronomy when there's a galaxy that's found that has less dark matter than other galaxies. So quite fascinating. It's a huge mystery. Without dark matter, our universe would look very different. In Einstein's time and before, people looked at the stars. They sat there in the sky, you know, other than the rotation due to the Earth. And people thought the universe was static. This was the dominant scientific opinion even in the 1900s, that the stars and galaxies just sort of hung there and didn't really move. Einstein's equations predicted that gravitational forces would cause all those stars to uh, sort of fall back inward. Um, why don't they? Well, the Big Bang hypothesis came along and said, well, that's because the universe started with some initial outward momentum. Well, all that was quite revolutionary and surprising. And then something even more surprising happened in the last few decades. It's, it's, hard to, it's hard to explain how remarkable this next sort of mystery is. People found that not only is the universe expanding due to that initial uh, momentum from the big pain, but apparently the rate of expansion is accelerating. It's the one thing you would not expect the universe to do. 
you know, if it were expanding from the Big Bang, it would eventually slow down and, and fall inward or maybe just gradually slow down forever. Um, but to accelerate the expansion, that's that's a huge scientific mystery. And the, and the best available hypothesis for that is something called dark energy. It's a quantum force that, wrote, that figures in Einstein's equations and creates that expanding acceleration. Very surprising. Another thing that's quite shocking about the universe is that there are such large scale structures that there are voids with very few stars and galaxies. And then the galaxies tend to cluster on filaments and surfaces or sort of membranes that surround those voids. And those voids are so unimaginably big, you know, billions of light years. It's, it's incredible how big those structures are. But based on the Big Bang hypothesis, there's really no way for the universe to be so different in this area where there's a void in this area with a cluster of galaxies. There's just no good explanation for that. So along comes cosmology with the best available hypothesis. The current explanation for the existence of such large scale structures is called inflation. It's the idea that the universe expanded within a few microseconds from marble size to very, very big so rapidly that quantum fluctuations were, were stretched out and became the largest concretions of galaxies and, and large scale structures of the universe, so inflation. Now these three are, are sort of well known. They kind of leak out into popular thought. People are aware of them. Um, basically I'm talking about dark matter, uh, dark energy and, and cosmic inflation. The fourth one is a little less well known. I'm kind of enamored of this one because it's, it's, uh, it's quite interesting in its own right. Why is the universe so orderly? Based on the laws of thermodynamics, all systems become more disorderly. Um, you know, th things break down and decay. You know, if there's something here and not something there, eventually the molecules spread out to sort of fill that space uniformly. We can only have an increase in order if we have energy flowing through the system. And in, in our Earth, we have energy coming from the sun to the Earth, and the flow of energy through the Earth system allows us to become more orderly, more organized over time. In fact, the Earth sort of exports entropy or exports disorder out the dark side into the interstellar medium. We're sort of projecting disorder on the space outside our solar system and that allows our earth locally to become more organized. That's how we avoid violating the laws of thermodynamics. But on the scale of the universe, it gets even more mysterious. The Big Bang was a very hot amorphous um, thing where all particles were sort of overlapping. There was no distinction between atomic forces and particles, just a hot soup. Uh, the entropy or the disorder of that system is very, very high. Yet we don't see that when we look out in the universe. We see something that's very organized. Galaxies and stars and solar systems orbiting in a crystal and beautiful orderly way. What happened to the disorder? It's, it's a bit of a scientific mystery. Well, that disorder went somewhere. It turns out that nearly every galaxy has a um, supermassive black hole in the center. And black holes are kind of like a vacuum for entropy. They just suck up disorder. And those black holes have sort of absorbed 99.99 plus percent of the entropy or disorder in the universe. And that allows the rest of what we see to be beautiful and orderly. So in some strange cosmic sense, those supermassive black holes are our friends. Just don't go near them. Okay. And lastly, this is one that connects a little bit with our topic. Um, after the Big Bang, the universe got very cool. Um, the hydrogen gas just spread out and became just hydrogen molecules and just sort of filled um, the universe kind of like, like a fog of hydrogen. And the universe sort of went dark. We call that the cosmic dark ages. Due to gravitational attraction and slight non-uniformities in density, the first stars clumped up and formed, and gravitational heating caused those stars to ignite, created fusion, and stars and galaxies began to form. We call that the cosmic dawn, or the epoch of reionization, more technically. Well, that period between the Big Bang and the cosmic dawn, called the cosmic dark ages, is very mysterious. There's a lot of things that are unknown that cosmologists would like to find out. And that is a motivation for what we're going to talk about next, the instruments that scientists use to understand and resolve these mysteries. Okay, that's uh, largely done through radio astronomy. 
The red image in the middle shows a white dot, and that's the hot gases around the supermassive black hole that's at the center of our galaxy. That was big news about a year ago in science because something unexpected happened when that black hole gobbled up some, some gases or stars or whatever. The picture on the upper right is an Einstein ring. That's light from a really bright object that's being bent around the supermassive object and we observe it as a ring, even though the object was a point source. And the lower right image is a supermassive spinning object that's shooting out energy and, and matter out of its poles, and those run into the interstellar medium and create turbulence uh, from those jets. All those are radio pictures, so radio astronomy is essential to understanding and answering these mysteries of the universe. So here are the instruments we use. This is a very simplified technological history of radio astronomy. On the left, we have large dishes. That's kind of an old school way to do astronomy. China just built what will probably remain the largest antenna ever built by humankind. Uh, that was finished a number of years ago called the FAST or 500 meter spherical telescope. Um, and then you can see the Arecibo telescope, which unfortunately collapsed a few years ago. And then the Green Bank Telescope, um, also in that leftmost panel of pictures, which I'll talk about a few slides later. Well, then attention turned to arrays of mid-sized dishes in New Mexico and, and uh, high mountains of Chile. There's also an array of dishes around the whole Earth called Very Long Baseline Interferometer, VLBI. That was big news when that global aggregation of dishes was used to image the, the first black hole. That's potentially Nobel Prize winning research done with radio telescopes. Moving towards what I'm interested in, we have cluster feeds, which turns those dishes into multi-pixel radio cameras, but we don't have full control over the image. We can't fully sample with, with complete pixels what we're trying to look at. So on the right, we have uh, true phased array antennas or dense phased arrays. And that's where we create an actual radio camera where we have full control and we can image patches of the sky to look at dark matter, aggregating gas clouds, black holes and pulsars and so forth. Okay, now we'll transition from the big picture to something very, very technical uh, at the detail level. This is a simple rendition of a phased array. Each of those point radiators emits a spherical wave, but with adjusted delays, time delays or phase delays for those spherical waves, so that add up to create a plane wave going in an offset direction um, signified by the blue arrow. That's the basic idea of a transmitting phased array. In the big picture, here are some types of phased arrays. I'm interested in electronically steered arrays where we use digital or analog control to scan beams um, and do other things with the radiation pattern of the array. Uh, active phased arrays have amplification or electronically driven elements in their uh, control systems. Passive phased arrays can have phase delays with unpowered electronics. There are ways of doing that with electro-optic substances, but no amplification. There's a little bit of overlap in the terminology. Some people would call a, a passive phased array with no electronic gain if it's steering the beam, they would call the active in the beam steering sense. So there's a little bit of you know, non uniformity in how we use these terms, that's okay. Fixed arrays or corporate fed arrays use traces on a PCB or transmission lines to produce phase delays. Those are non steerable antenna arrays. Those are very important in, in uh, small satellite terminals and so forth. Um, sensing radars that some of you may be involved in. Okay, now we'll look at the geometries. How can we organize the elements in an antenna array? This is the classroom phased array, arrays faced in one dimension along a line. Um, if we add control of the excitations for a one dimensional array, we arrive at the ULA. Uh, that's what we teach with. That's what we use to understand the most important effects on a phased array, uh, theoretically optimal uh, phased array designs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, times thousands or tens of thousands of papers and, and uh, areas of work. An array is expensive because we need electronics for every element. So to reduce the cost, we might re remove some of the elements or randomize the spacing. That's a very, very important area, area and has been for many decades. 
to do beam scanning in all directions and to cover a full sphere or hemisphere. We have two dimensional arrays. And in a few niche applications, we even have three dimensional arrays, although that's relatively uncommon. There are many different, this is a huge area. There are many different sort of subcategories. To reduce the cost of the electronics we need to scan the beam with the phased array, there's a Butler matrix, which is an analog network that allows a signal coming in one port to create phase delays where, where we excite the antennas. A Rotman lens is a way to do that with dielectrics, and all this is under the heading of reducing the electronics cost. Conformal arrays are bent to wrap around a fuselage or other non-flat surface. Connected arrays are really important in my world. We actually take the elements and electrically connect them and then design those connections to increase the bandwidth of the array. Reflect arrays and transmit arrays are very much in vogue in my community. People are working on this all around the world. Reflect array is an array of patches or other conducting elements where we change something electronically about those patches. So a beam reflects, a wave reflects, then forms into a beam where we can control the pointing direction. That's a reflect array and transmit arrays are backlit in the same way. Array feeds is my personal uh, research area of interest. An array feed is a phased array that's used with a large dish or reflector antenna. And I'll show some pictures later on. How do we analyze phased arrays and design them? There are three broad categories. The array factor method has been around for many decades since before I was born. Um, I'll have a slide or two on that in just a minute. That's kind of a pencil and paper approach. There's an infinite array approximation that allows us to model the coupling between elements. When the, the elements interact with each other a little bit, and we have, a, we have a large array with lots of elements that can create strange and unusual effects like scan blindness and so forth. And then um, for applications where neither of the older school methods work, we use modeling tools, software. More on that in just a minute. So first, the array factor method. There'll be a little bit of math on the next few slides just to give you a visual flavor of the kinds of things we do when we work with these methods. In the array factor method, we take the field rate by each element and add that. And then we make an approximation. We mathematically factorize that into the field that one antenna in the array would radiate, multiplied by an array factor that accounts for the geometry of the array. Okay, very powerful. Uh, the approximation we make is we assume that all the elements are identical and in the same environment in the array. And that's not true for edge elements versus interior elements. There's an approximation there. Okay. The philosophy there is we've decoupled the array analysis problem into designing the element and designing the geometry of the array. So that's the whole point of the array factor method. That's why it's so powerful and so ubiquitous to use. It is approximate, but very powerful. Over the years, people have written thousands of papers and many, many books on the topic. Uniform linear array, which we analyze in the classroom. Dolph Chebyshev array, which has a theoretical op optimality property. Shelkinoff representation is really mathematically fun. You can put zeros in the complex plane and then move those zeros in controlled ways to do interesting things with the array, the way the array radiates in terms of scanning angle and side lobes and many, many others. That's just the beginning. Oh, there's a whole alphabet soup of techniques based on the array factor method. A little bit on the second major category, that's the infinite array approximation. That's the way to use analytical formulas where you sum over an infinite array, and then you can account for coupling effects as the elements interact with each other, okay? The idea is that if the array is large, we can ignore edge effects, and we can treat the array as if it were infinite, okay? And that leads to analytical formulas where we do infinite sums over the array elements. Uh, that leads to a concept called embedded element efficiency. When we put elements into a big array and try to excite one of the elements, it doesn't accept all of the power because of a reflection coefficient that's non-zero caused by coupling between elements. On the receive side, that's related to conservation of energy. If I have a wave coming towards a receive array, those coupling and interaction effects reduce the amount of power each element receives until it's at the physics limit, which is the power incident on the whole array divided um, by the number of elements. That's the amount of, of power that's available for each element to array, and that, that's intimately connected with these coupling effects that the infinite array approximation lets us account for. 
Okay, another effect that comes up when a ray is a very large is scan blindness. If we try and electronically steer the beam, suddenly it doesn't work. Components can fry and the phased ray doesn't work. And that was discovered back in the 1960s and 70s when they built the first large early warning radars. Okay, well, that's how things have been done for many decades. Very powerful, very successful, very important. But in some applications, these might not be good enough. If we're doing terrestrial communications, there's a lot of ambient noise and really, really pushing the design of the array doesn't always bring a return. But if we're looking towards the sky, the microwave sky is very, very cool. Very little ambient noise coming from the sky. Most of the noise that comes from the sky is a remnant from the Big Bang, cosmic background radiation, very, very, very low in intensity. So in that application, actually, we get a reward by really pushing the design of the array and making the array better. Um, radio astronomy, remote sensing, and satellite communications are, are the big areas where that's needed. We, we need more powerful, more accurate methods than the old school approaches. And interestingly, in my world, this has stimulated a lot of interesting research. We even have new figures of merit that have been standardized in the IEEE uh, sta standard uh, documents that have come out of this research and new design methods and so forth. It's, it's been quite interesting. Okay, a little bit on the details of how we do this sort of third approach where we use numerical modeling um, to model the array. Here's an example. Let's suppose I want to design a phased array feed. That's a phased array that works with the dish. I have to model the phased array feed front end. That's the phased array itself. Then I combine that with the reflector. Then I use circuit theory or network theory to add the electronics that connect to the array. I have to model the digital beam forming all in software. From that, I calculate figures of merit. Is the array sensitive enough? Is the SNR good enough? And so on and so forth. And then I iterate around that loop using optimization software until I get the right phased array design. Here's how we do that a little more schematically. We have each piece of the system represented here. And then here's how we model each one. High frequency approximations for the dish a software package for the phased array, matrix theory or network theory for the electronics. Then here we transition over to the world of array signal processing. That's very matrix based. We model the beam forming. So we're, it's interesting. We combine almost every major analysis method into one package when we try to design these, uh, these types of phased arrays. A little more detail on how we actually model the phase array. What are we asking the commercial software to do? We give it a very specific job. We hand it a candidate array design, and we have the software excite one of the elements and get what's called an embedded element pattern. That embedded element pattern includes all effects, including interactions between elements, coupling, edge effects, and so on and so forth. And we do that for each of the big N elements in the array. So basically, our first step is to model embedded element patterns with the array transmitting, okay? Then we want to aggregate those embedded element patterns. That's a little bit complicated because on the left, we have our digital signal processing that's driving the array as a transmitter, but then we have some matrix relationships that relate those excitations to the current that actually flows in the elements. The matrix relationship is on the bottom left and that comes from network theory. Once we do the network theory, we can combine that on the right with embedded element patterns. And now we know the beam that the array radiates for a given set of digital excitations, all based on network theory and the embedded element patterns. So that's sort of two of our blocks in our big picture combined. Unfortunately, we are not interested in my world in transmitting arrays. We are generally interested in receiving arrays for astronomy where we're receiving signals from deep space, remote sensing, receiving black body radiation from our from objects of interest. And on satellite communications, it's the receive side that has special challenges. We need to go from a transmit model to a receive model. And this formula shows how we do this. We have the transmit model of our array embedded element patterns. We have the signal the array is receiving and then a physics scale factor. Interestingly enough, this formula is very important. It's very powerful. We use it all the time, but you can't find it in textbooks. If I take this formula and manipulate it a little bit and, and convert it from voltage to power, it becomes a formula that's in all textbooks. But in phased rays, we don't need power. We need voltages because they include the phase information 
that a phased array uses to, to work its magic. Very important formula, not found in books. I've been saying that for years as I've given presentations like this all around the world. A couple of years ago, I was in Albuquerque. I had a gentleman raise his hand and say, actually, I've seen that formula in a book and I've heard that so many times. People have told me many, many times, you know, Carl, I've seen that formula in this and this book. Well, they're never right. But this one time in Albuquerque a few years ago, the gentleman was correct. There is actually a book where this formula can be found. These annotations have some explanation for the math. And down below in the fine print, you can see that there is a publication and a book that actually has this formula in it. A little bit of interesting backstory there for some important math that we used in phased array design. Moving on. Mutual coupling, it turns out that's one of the most important issues we have when designing high performance receiving phased array antennas. Okay, the, when I put elements in an array next to each other, they perturb each other a little bit. Some of the energy radiates over towards the next element then rescatters, and that changes how the elements radiate. That's interactions between elements, okay? Um, mutual coupling in, in a precise sense is actually defined a little bit differently from that. Uh, mutual coupling, we define most precisely in terms of the ports that feed our phased array. If I look at the array as a black box end port network, mutual coupling means if I put in a current here, I get an induced voltage there, and that gives me a non-zero matrix element in the array mutual impedance matrix. That fundamentally is mutual coupling. It's related to putting in energy here. It sort of radiates over this way. Most of it goes that way if some radiates down and then comes out the lower element. That's mutual coupling, it's a port thing. Mutual coupling has been studied ad infinitum in my community. It first became important when phased arrays didn't work as you tried to scan the beam and got scan blindness. Um, then computers got powerful enough to model this. Then people started studying mutual coupling for all sorts of applications. Interestingly enough, if you hurt your knee, and get your knee imaged in an MRI that uses a phased array and you can't tune the phased array accurately unless you know something about the mutual coupling. So that community took, took up the banner. Then came MIMO or multiple output, multiple input communications where you have multiple antennas for one radio service. Uh, mutual coupling limits the diversity gain you can get with a MIMO system. So minimizing coupling for MIMO antennas was a big area for the last couple of decades. And then my field took it up. Mutual coupling turns out to be really important when designing high performance uh, phased array antennas for astronomy and other high sensitivity applications. Mutual coupling is related in a very interesting way to conservation of energy. It seems really mysterious and complicated, but you can demystify mutual coupling a little bit by thinking about conservation of energy. And I'll try and illustrate that in some pictures here, okay? Suppose I have a, an antenna array where I put the elements right next to each other, maybe a millimeter apart, 100 elements packed into a tiny sugar cube, okay? And I've drawn the little antenna symbols as overlapping, so you can see that they're close to each other. Then what I do is I load each element. Let's suppose I can get a milliwatt of power if I had just one antenna. Well, if I had 100 antennas, can I get 100 milliwatts? If I have a thousand antennas, can I get a whole watt out of my sugar cube of tiny antennas? That's a very fundamental, very interesting physics question. Well, here I have a little clue. If you can see my cursor, the impedance is looking into that source, think, thinking of that as a Thevenin network. The impedance is actually a matrix. And because the elements are close together, that matrix is non-diagonal. Mathematically, the non-diagonality of that matrix limits the power that each resistor can extract from my network load. It just comes out of the matrix math. The math is a bit complicated, but you could do it easily in MATLAB or some other software tool that handles matrices. Very simply, that matrix relationship limits the power that each resistor can extract. It's way less than one watt for a thousand elements at a milliwatt per element. The available power one element might be a milliwatt, but as soon as I add more resistors, that available power goes down because of the matrix nature here. The text that will show up just explains that in words, okay? The power is not additive for densely packed phased array. Because of mutual coupling, the power goes down to about one over nth
for n elements, one over nth of the power that's incident on the physical extent of the array. So my sugar cube is small. The incident power is very low. So I get much less than a watt, only, only a little bit more than what one antenna, maybe a milliwatt or so for my example. Okay, so mutual coupling is fundamentally related to conservation of energy. Mutual coupling has to be there for a tightly packed array or the physics is violated. Okay, now we're sort of inching in the direction. We're moving from the physics of the antennas over to the signal processing world. Okay, we're moving out of my world into uh, Dr. Jeff's world, one of my close collaborative colleagues who works in the signal processing community. So we take the signals from our receiving phase array, amplify them, condition the signals, down convert them, digitize them. Then in the digital domain, in an FPGA or GPU or a chip, we're doing digital beam forming. We multiply by complex numbers where the phase angle of that complex number does our phase delays and creates an array beam. If we take the voltages coming out of our analog signal chains, form an outer product, and do a time expectation, we get what's called a correlation matrix. People in my community and antenna world don't often deal with correlation matrices, but it becomes very, very important for the kinds of applications we're interested, interested in. That correlation matrix has a matrix from the signal and some contributions from noise external to the array, from the antennas themselves, and from the electronics after the antennas. And then I might have interference from unwanted transmitters. Okay. Here's a little bit of an intuitive feel for what a correlation matrix is like. If I look at just the signal coming in as a plane wave from distant point source, I get a rank one matrix. And that the vector of that rank one matrix has in it phase delays related to the angle arrival of the signal. If I have noise, approximately I get a diagonal matrix because the noise coming out of each of my array elements is, is mostly uncorrelated. In a real array though, because of coupling effects, the noise gets correlated, and this is from a phased array example. Okay, so signal rank one, noise correlation matrix is full rank or rank N, plus a off diagonal perturbation, just to get a feel for that. Okay, now we're moving around our analysis process to the figures of merit. Once we model the array, once we form beams, um, how well is the array working? We need figures of merit. Well, the dollars parameter, the fundamental parameter in almost any system, including our astronomical sensing applications, is SNR. We just need the most signal and the least noise. We might pay millions of dollars to get a tenth of a dB or one dB improvement. A one dB is about a 20% improvement in SNR. That could be worth millions. Well, SNR depends on the signal intensity. So for convenience, we normalize out the signal intensity and we take that SNR and rescale it. And we call that G over T or A over T or sometimes sensitivity. Okay. Sensitivity is just SNR normalized to a unit signal source. Now, sensitivity in the electronics world has a different meaning. In the electronics and receiver electronics world, the sensitivity is sometimes the minimum power level we can reliably detect. That's a different usage of the term. For me in the antenna world, sensitivity is just SNR scaled to a unit source. Well, once I know the SNR, I need to tie that to the performance of specific subsystems. So we have a bunch of dimensionless efficiencies between zero and one that influence SNR. How well am I using the aperture? Am I collecting all the energy that's arriving at my phase array antenna aperture? Radiation efficiency, are the losses interfering? Um, receiving efficiency, um, that's kind of like radiation efficiency, what works for receivers. The noise matching efficiency relates to how much noise the electronics after the antenna is adding. Each of those figures of merit comes together to give me SNR. Here's how that works. This little formula shows how we scale SNR to uh, make it so that it's for a unit source. We call the A over T or G over T. Um, a over T and G over T are just used in different communities, so they're roughly the same thing. And that is how I relate the sensitivity or the rescaled SNR to all the different sub-efficiencies. Radiation efficiency caused by losses, aperture efficiency, if I don't fully illuminate the aperture, or use all the energy incident on the aperture, those are le become less than one. That reduces SNR and sensitivity, not good. In the denominator, I have all the noise sources. Sky noise I can't avoid, that's coming right at my antenna. 
I'm going to have spillover coming from the ground. I need to reduce that or it adds in the denominator and reduces my figure of merit. Loss, if the physical structures of my antennas, copper, brass, aluminum, or whatever, the ohmic losses in that or dielectrics add noise on the receive side. That's bad. And then my last term is related to the electronics, the amplifiers and any components after the antennas, they add their own noise. We want to minimize that. Okay. Now, a little factoid, which is unappreciated sometimes even by experts. And I've given this talk to people that know more than I do. You know, people have been working in this field for many years. There are some common misunderstandings. And this may not mean much to some of you, but to a few of you, it will stick in your mind. You may remember this. Let's suppose my antenna or the el antenna elements in an array are not well impedance matched to the amplifiers they're connected to. I'll ask a group of antenna experts, point to the term in this formula where the badness of impedance match matches shows up. And they'll say, well, here in the numerator, they'll say here, down here in the denominator, all incorrect. Almost all the terms in these formulas by convention in the antenna community by IEEE standard are, are defined for available powers. Available powers always into a conjugate match load, so we take out impedance matching. So where does the bad of a poor impedance match happen in this formula? It happens in the bottom right. Okay, impedance matching increases the equivalent noise of the electronics. Okay, now the impedance match is a problem with the antenna. So why is that reflected in the, in the electronics noise? It doesn't make the amplifier worse. What it does is it makes the equivalent noise of the amplifier worse. The equivalent noise is how much amplifier noise would have to come from the antenna to represent the electronics noise. If I have an impedance mismatch, I have to increase the equivalent noise to get the same electronics noise at the output. So that's a little sidebar that for some of you may at some point in your career become meaningful. I mentioned earlier that this research in high performance receiving arrays has stimulated the development of new standards. Uh, this illustrates that. The IEEE standard for antenna terms for um, since uh, the last five or six years has had new terms in it just for active receiving arrays. And you can see how that works here just schematically. New terms and new measurement methods, okay? For very complicated receiving arrays, those don't transmit. I can't take a signal, put it in the DSP, have it come out the analog to digital converters, that's backwards, and have it go through the amplifiers, which are pointing towards the receive direction, and then come out the transmitters. My receiving array just does not transmit. So I can't define antenna gain the way we normally do for simple antennas. We need new terms and new ways of measurement. Okay, what's quite fascinating, and this hopefully might be one of my little takeaways that might stick in your mind, how do we measure and characterize the as-built receiving phased array. We can't make it transmit very easily. It just doesn't transmit. It's inherently a receiver. How do we characterize it? Well, for most traditional antennas, we define everything in terms of radiated power. All antenna parameters revolve around radiated power, power density, and total radiated power and the power coming to the antenna. That's gain and directivity, and radiation efficiency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. For this little niche sub area of the antenna world, we have to do things differently. We need a new measurement techniques. We measure receiving antennas not with power, not with signal power, but with noise power. We bathe the array in noise, and then we change that noise level like in a Y-factor method, and we can learn most of what we need to know and even all that we need to know about that receive, that full receiver system using noise instead of power. So for transmitters, we use power. For receiving antennas that are simple, we can treat them as transmitters, we use power. That's most of the antenna world. But in this little sub area, we don't use power, we use noise. The pictures here show one of the first times this was ever done. This is BYU students in a government research lab in West Virginia doing the first um, of these noise-based measurements. Now, these systems have been replicated, upgraded, and they're used around the world uh, from Australia to Canada to Europe. Um, and the measurement technique is now in the IEEE recommended practices for antenna measurements. In other words, the standard for antenna tests. A couple of slides on the final stage of our system, how do we actually form the beams in digital? Um, 
the sort of parent beam forming approach that sort of rules all of this kind of like the one ring to rule them all, maximum SNR. All other beam formers might have good qualities and might do other things, but they either keep the same SNR or reduce it. There's always an SNR panel if you want to do more than just get the most signal for the least noise. What's interesting is in our research group over the years, we worked really carefully through the match, the math, and we found there's some fundamental connections between this matrix-based array signal processing viewpoint and what we do in, in, antenna, in the antenna community. For phased arrays in the antenna world, we try to maximize the gain or maximize the directivity or just conjugate match of the fields, which is very simple to do mathematically. It turns out those are all, those are all derivations of the max SNR beam formants. That's why I call it the parent. All of the beam formers sort of come from max SNR. Now, this is not really my home community. I'm just, a, just an amateur here. But this slide just shows how vast and deep and mature the array signal processing community is. If you want to do it, it's been done. If it hasn't been done, that, that'd be quite rare. This is a huge, huge world, a huge field. And you can see some buzzwords on this slide. I'm getting down to the end. What I'm going to do in the last few slides is show some pictures of applications. You have a mental image of what we're dealing with. This slide shows some of the phased array feeds. That's a phased array with dish that have been built around the world over the years, starting in the middle in the early 90s, going to things that are being built right now on the periphery of my, of my images. Some are BYU, some are being built by international groups around the world. At various frequencies, ranging from hundreds of megahertz to millimeter wave, 70 to 90 gigahertz. This is one of our biggest current projects at BYU, along with Cornell University, Arizona State, and all funded by the National Science Foundation. We are building an imaging phased array that will go on one of the world's largest telescopes in West Virginia. And you can see some pretty pictures there of what it can do scientifically when it's finally done and operational. I put a star by Pulsar Search. Pulsar Search just hit the news big time in the last few weeks. The Nanograv collaboration has been working for years to collect a database of hundreds to thousands of pulsars. They carefully track the timing of the pulses coming from those rapidly rotating objects, and they look at small deviations as ghost-like gravitational waves ripple through the universe and change space-time. That collaboration finally released at one of its first major publications, and they were able to detect a very low um, ripple in the universe Basically, if the noise were a salt bubble, it's still kind of going like this from the Big Bang. And that is, in my view, potentially Nobel Prize winning physics and science, but it's a very large collaboration. I'm glad I don't have to pick what name to attach it to. That's going to be difficult. That's up to Sweden. A little bit more on Alpaca, our BYU Cornell um, uh, phase, imaging phased array. The whole thing is cryogenically cooled inside a thermal flask and cooled with liquid helium. You can see the antenna elements are wide band dipoles underneath foam and a vacuum window. Here's a, a view of some of the antenna modules. This will all be cryogenically cooled and you can see some of the connections there. This shows the built front end not very exciting because it's just a box, but the antennas and all the electronics are all in there. That's been uh, vacuumed and cooled at Cornell University. It will soon come to BYU for integration testing. This slide shows the digital. We have fiber cables that bring the signal and then they're converted from optical to analog and then sampled to digital. They go into, the signals then go into FPGAs for channelization and then into GPUs for beam forming and imaging. What, what I'm picturing here is multiple racks of electronics that sit in our research lab here on campus. Just another slide showing other applications, satellite communications, remote sensing and other things. We've tried to put these phase arrays on PCBs to make them cheaper, integrated electronics and so on and so forth, use them for radar and other applications, just to show some other tantalizing pictures in case you're interested. Okay, we have a book with some of our collaborators in this community that came out a few years ago that sort of encapsulates all of this into a, into a single publication. This is my last slide. Um, I'm not sure if 
I can allow for questions here. I would love to if I can, but at this point, I'll stop talking and conclude my presentation. And I'll thank you for your attention. And with that, I'm done. <laughs>